thank you to all of them, and I look forward to hearing the amendments to the robust discussion on the floor and to continuing to work with my colleague, Senator Portman, um, as we try and move this bill through the process. Thank you very much. Mr. President, the Senator from Ohio. Mr. President, uh, we're finally here on the floor, and I want to thank my colleague, Senator Shaheen, for her comments and also working with me over the last few years to get to this point where we can be talking about something that brings us together, I hope, as a Senate, uh, which is this effort to ensure that we have an energy plan for America that can help bring back jobs, uh, help fix our trade deficit, and help spark, spark an American manufacturing renaissance, and that's the Energy Savings and Industrial Competitiveness Act. It's about energy efficiency. It's about using what we have more efficiently. Uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense for us to move forward. As Senator Shaheen said, it's a first step, uh, but it's an important step. Uh, I also want to thank the chair and ranking member of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, Senator Wyden, who spoke earlier, Senator Mikowski, who's here with us on the floor and spoke earlier, for all the support they've given us in this effort over the last few years uh, to get it through the committee hearing process, the markup process, and, uh, and to add some uh, some important elements to the legislation. Uh, we'll see more as the amendment process proceeds. I also want to thank Leader Reid for helping us bring this bipartisan legislation to the floor today, and I want to thank Senator McConnell, who's been very supportive of us moving this process forward. This is, as has been said on the floor uh, this afternoon, really the first substantive energy legislation we've seen on the Senate floor in, in a while, maybe, maybe six years, and uh, it requires help from both sides of the aisle to get to that point. It is bipartisan. It's also supported, by the way, on both sides of the Capitol. So you have people in the House, including some House members I spoke to earlier today, who are very interested in what we're doing over here on this legislation because they have uh, companion legislation, not identical, but similar legislation in the House that they're working on on a bipartisan basis. So this is one that I think has a good shot of getting through the Senate significantly. I think it also has a good shot of getting through the House and going to the President for signature and then helping to move America forward with a more sensible energy policy. We're going to see a lot of amendments uh, on the floor, and I think a number of these amendments will be bipartisan and will help improve the bill. In fact, I'm looking at a list here of about a dozen bipartisan amendments. Uh, these are amendments, some of which we talked about in committee, some of which have come up since the process. And I think, again, a lot of them uh, involve some very thoughtful uh, work done by our colleagues, and I'm looking forward to having a debate on some of those. I actually have a list of 41 energy efficiency-related relevant amendments here. So this is an opportunity for us to have a broader debate on energy, but also to improve the energy efficiency legislation before us. Those of us uh, on this aisle talk a lot about the need for an all the above energy policy, and I certainly believe in it. I think we need to do everything we can to make ourselves more energy depend independent so that we're not dependent on dangerous and volatile parts of the world, including the Mideast. We've certainly seen that uh, here in the last couple of weeks where what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Egypt, affects what goes on here in this country in terms of our energy costs and, and certainly our economy. So this need for energy efficiency should, should lead us to want to be sure that we're including um, this legislation in the mix. We need a policy that harnesses more of our domestic resources, and I believe in that. I think we ought to be producing more energy in the ground here in America. I'm for producing more, uh, but I'm also for being sure we don't miss the other part of the equation, which is using less. So I believe producing more and using less is a good policy. Now, I think this is the part of the uh, using less part that maybe we don't talk about as much on this side of the aisle that's also very important. I think it's important in part because it creates jobs. Um, it's a bill that's supported, by the way, by over 260 businesses, business association advocacy groups from the National Association of Manufacturers and the Chamber of Commerce to the Sierra Club and the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, the Christian Coalition is supporting it. And I've got a list here of these 260 trade associations, business organizations. And Mr. President, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to include this in the record at this time because there's too many names to go through on the floor, but it's a very impressive list. Without objection. I think the legislation got through the Senate Energy Committee with a vote of 19 to 3, partly because of this support, because members realize this is going to help them and their constituents. But simply put, I think this legislation that the Senior Senator of New Hampshire and I have worked on and proposed makes good environmental sense, I think it makes good energy sense, and I think it makes good economic sense too. I've spent time visiting with businesses throughout my state of Ohio, 
and on this bill and on this whole issue of energy, and they all tell me the same thing, which is pretty obvious. That is, energy is an important component of their business. It's a part of the cost of doing business, and energy efficiency makes them more able to compete in the global economy. We do live in a global economy, and every day businesses in my state go up against businesses not just in other states but in other countries. And we're not going to be able to compete uh, on everything. We don't want to compete on wages with developing countries, for instance. Uh, we want to have good wages in this country and good benefits. Uh, we can compete uh, on the quality of the goods we produce. We want to keep that quality high. But we've got to be sure that we are giving these businesses the ability to compete by helping to keep their energy costs low. Again, producing more, using less. And what this legislation does that's very significant is it helps the private sector develop the energy efficiency techniques, technologies of the future. We make it easier for employers to use tools that will reduce their costs, enabling them to put those savings toward expanding jobs, plant and equipment, hiring new workers. The proposals contained in our bill are really common sense reforms we've needed for a long time. The bill contains no mandates. Let me repeat that. There are not mandates in this legislation on the private sector, period. In fact, many of our proposals come as a direct result of conversations we've had with folks in the private sector about how the federal government can help them to become more energy efficient and save money that they can then reinvest in their businesses and their communities. Here's a brief overview of some of the major parts of the legislation, some of which have been already described ably by my colleague from New Hampshire. But I just want to review it quickly. First, it does specifically help manufacturers. It reforms what's called the Advanced Manufacturing Office at the Department of Energy by providing clear guidelines on its responsibilities, one of which ought to be to help manufacturers develop energy savings technologies uh, for their businesses. And this is a shift we think is important. We think they've gotten away from that a little bit, the Department of Energy. We need to be sure they get back to it. It facilitates the already existing efforts of companies around the country that are trying to implement cost-saving energy efficiency policies by streamlining the way government agencies in this arena work with them. It also increases partnerships with national labs. The national laboratories have a lot of great research we'd like to be sure is commercialized and shared with the private sector. Also, it increases partnerships with energy and service technology providers and the national labs together to leverage private sector expertise toward energy efficiency goals. The legislation strengthens the model building codes so that builders and states that choose to adopt them will have the most up-to-date energy efficient codes that are available anywhere, best practices. It also establishes university-based building training and assessment centers. Uh, industrial assessment centers are located around the country. There's one in Dayton, Ohio. I've had the opportunity to visit with one of the uh, researchers there recently who was out working with mid-sized, smaller companies on helping make them more energy efficient. They're strongly supportive of this legislation because they want to expand the good work they're doing to be able to help more businesses to be more energy efficient, be more competitive, add more jobs. These centers also under our legislation will be helping to train the next generation of workers in energy efficient commercial building design and operation. Not only will these programs save energy, but they'll also help provide our students and unemployed workers who need these skills with the skills they'll need to compete in this growing energy field. To repeat, this bill is not about forcing companies to become more energy efficient or imposing mandates. It's about incentives, and it's about giving these companies the help they're asking for. And we can do it, by the way, at no additional expense to the taxpayer. Why? Because the cost of this legislation is fully offset. In other words, we change other programs at the Department of Energy to pay for the cost of this legislation. According to the Congressional Budget Office, it has no impact. It's deficit neutral. But in fact, it will save taxpayers money, because all of us as taxpayers will save money because of another provision of the legislation, and that's because we go after the largest energy user in the world to try to make them more efficient. That's the United States government. We want to be sure the United States government starts to practice what it preaches, because as it talks to the rest of us about the need for more energy efficiency, we find that at the federal government, there are lots of opportunities to make them less wasteful, more efficient. It directs the Department of Energy to issue recommendations that employ energy efficiency on everything from computer hardware to operation and maintenance processes, energy efficiency software, and power management tools. Senator Wyden had some good examples earlier of some of the waste in the federal government that this bill will go after. So this is smart because it's the right thing to do in order to save energy, but also it helps taxpayers because it's going to reduce the costs at the federal government. It also takes a really interesting common sense step of allowing the General Services Administration to actually update the building designs they have to meet energy efficient standards that have been developed since these designs were finalized, some of them many years ago. 
and they can't update them. So we certainly want to be sure the new federal buildings that are being constructed are using the most up-to-date efficiency standards. This legislation permits that to happen. The government's been looking for places to tighten its belt. This is one. Energy efficiency, I think, is a great place to start. All this adds up to a piece of legislation that Americans across the spectrum can support. It's fully offset. It contains no mandates. It requires the federal government to be more efficient. According to a recent study of our legislation, in 12 years, by 2025, Shaheen Portman is estimated to aid in the creation of 136,000 new jobs. The report says it's going to save consumers $13.7 billion a year in reduced energy costs by 2030. A vote on this legislation is a critical step for achieving this goal of a true all-of-the-above energy strategy. It produces more energy at home, yes, but also uses less energy and uses it more efficiently. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to come down to the floor, offer their amendments, let's have a good debate and discussion, and let's support this underlying bill. Let's be sure that it leaves the Senate with a strong vote and with a rigorous debate to ensure that it can pass the House of Representatives, where, as I said earlier, there's a lot of interest, and that it can go to the President for his signature to take this important step toward making our country more competitive, more energy efficient, less dependent on foreign oil, uh, and again, creating more jobs in the process while improving the environment. It's a win-win-win. I think there's at least three wins there. Thank you very much uh, again to my colleague from New Hampshire and the Chair and Ranking Members of the Energy Committee. We now look forward to entertaining some amendments and uh, we look forward to being here on the floor talking about a way to move our country forward in a way I think that provides a model for moving the Senate forward on other bipartisan measures. With that, Mr. President, I yield back my time. Hope the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. consent that the quorum call be issued. Without objection. Mr. Uh, President, I call up Amendment 1858. Clerk will report. Mr. President, I ask consent that further reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, this is, in my view, a very practical amendment offered by my friend and, and colleague from Oregon, Senator Merkley. It involves a study on standby power. The amendment would, uh, in effect, fund the study at the Department of Energy to look at standby power standards in states and other parts of the world to determine what is the most feasible and practical way to approach it. There is no authorization here. I think it's pretty obvious to members of the United States Senate there are a large number of electronic products, from televisions to cell phone chargers to microwaves that cannot uh, be completely turned off without being uh, unplugged and we ought to find ways to reduce uh, wasted standby uh, power. I want to yield to my friend and colleague from uh, Oregon. It's my intention to support his amendment. I think it's a practical uh, idea and uh, I would just yield uh, any time to Senator Merkley to explain uh, his uh, thoughtful amendment. Senator from Oregon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my, my senior colleague 
from Oregon. I uh, appreciate uh, very much your calling up this, this amendment and for your leadership on energy and specifically energy efficiency. And I would also like to uh, compliment my colleagues from Ohio and New Hampshire uh, who have worked so hard on this very valuable piece of the energy puzzle. How do we utilize the energy that we generate more efficiently? And specifically, this amendment uh, is related to standby power, the power that is wasted keeping devices ready to use at a moment's notice. And uh, I really prefer the term uh, vampire power or vampire electronics. This is, this is the power that our electronics suck out of our power system when they're doing absolutely nothing. And so um, this challenge of loss to vampire electronics is certainly something we, we ought to take on. Now, many electronic devices from television, and desktop computers, cell phone chargers, microwaves, they use energy when they're turned off but are still plugged in. And often you'll see that little light that tells you that it's still uh, plugged in. This wasted energy accounts for roughly 5% of the residential electricity use. So about one kilowatt in every 20 or one dollar in every 20 is utilized to keep those little lights blinking. Now the U.S. has yet to establish standards for efficiency in products related to standby power. Now some states have, have done so and other industrialized nations have taken action. And this amendment would simply tell the department to look at the standards established elsewhere in the world or in individual states, compare them and analyze them so we can consider whether a lot more could be done nationally here in the United States to make us more efficient. And uh, that efficiency uh, really is like uh, producing uh, just uh, free available power by uh, ending the, the waste. In fact, the EPA estimates that 100 billion kilowatt hours of electricity is wasted by vampire electronics each year. And that adds up to $10 billion in extra energy costs. Now, depending on the age of components, running a cable box, a large screen TV, a DVD player, a gaming console, surround sound setup, these can be like running a second refrigerator, a significant power draw. And DOE, Department of Energy, believes that it is feasible to reduce this waste from standby power by about 75%. Now, the, the, the value of that 75% reduction would be equivalent to, for free, erecting 25,000 3-megawatt wind turbines. Well, that's a lot of wind power being utilized. So let's do it. Under this amendment, the Department of Energy is instructed to conduct a study of standards for standard power appliances, electronic devices, that have been implemented by other states or other industrialized nations and to evaluate which of the standard study would be feasible and appropriate in the United States. A simple idea, an important study that could contribute substantially to the use of power effectively here in our economy. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you uh, to my colleagues for bringing this bill forward. Pres Madam President, Senator, Senator from Oregon. we are not going to vote on this amendment at, uh, at this time, but when we do, uh, I hope colleagues will support it. I think it's a very fine amendment, and with that, I yield the floor and uh, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mr. President. Senator from Oregon. I ask that the quorum call be uh, lifted. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent that my intern, Donnie Turner, have privileges to the floor for the balance of the day.
Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Objection. All right, uh, Mr. President, I think there's a little confusion here on the floor. There's, uh, I have an amendment that I've talked to virtually everyone. There's, uh, in fact, I can't find one person who's opposed to it. Uh, and it's a very simple thing. And of course, what I would ask is that I be able to set aside the pending amendment for the purpose of considering my amendment number uh, 1851. Now, let me make that and see if there's objection to that. Mr. President, uh, I object. Is, is there? Is there objection? I object. The objection is heard. Well, see, I thought it was the Democrats. Uh, Mr. President, let me just go ahead and just tell you what Senator it's all Pearl. about, because I know I'm going to be wanting to come back to the floor and uh, get this in the queue. And it's something now and then, it's very rare in this body that we come up with something that everyone is for, something that wasn't a part of the original legislation for a very good reason. We're talking about geothermal. Uh, right now, the, we all recall that in the uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005, uh, it was, there's a provision that requires the federal government have a percentage of its energy to, uh, to be uh, from renewable sources. Now, the problem is this. Uh, geothermal doesn't create any new energy. It just you lets you use the energy that is there, recover it, heat our homes, cool our homes, put it back, and then reuse it again. As I say, it's something that everyone is for. It's 100% renewable. And the only oversight originally was that uh, it, didn't, it did not actually create uh, energy. So the amendment would change this and allow geothermal heat pumps to be among the renewable energies that can be used by the federal government to meet its obligation under the 2005 energy law. And as I say, this amendment doesn't cost anything, it doesn't mandate anything, it simply provides another acceptable way for the federal government to meet its obligations in a cost-effective way. It's uh, non-controversial, it's something, as I say, that everyone wants, and it would be my hope that after that explanation that uh, the, the, the senator from Louisiana would be willing to let me bring it up just for the person of, of uh, considering it, putting it in the queue, and then going back to where we were uh, uh, acknowledging the objections that he might have to other amendments. Mr. Mr. President. Senator from Louisiana. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to sustain my objection, but I'm very hopeful that this can be worked out in short order as soon as uh, a vote on my amendment is locked down. Uh, and in fact, I'll go this far, it doesn't even have to be on this bill. It does have to be in the near future because the issue uh, with regard to which I'm very concerned happens on October 1st, so this is an extremely time-sensitive issue. I've had good discussions uh, with the majority, and it seems like we're going to be able to lock down that agreement hopefully very soon, but until then, I'm going to have to object. Senator from Oregon. Ken, I intend to support the Inhofe uh, Carper Amendment. In, in my view, this is really a, a common sense clarification of existing law, and I, I just want colleagues to have a sense of this is the kind of bipartisan work that Senator Murkowski talked about earlier that we have been trying to do, is to try to come to the Senate with, with ideas that really pass the smell test. I mean, they are common sense, they are practical. In that context, this amendment modifies the existing definition of renewable energy to provide that thermal energy that is generated from 
or avoided by renewable energy sources ought to be considered renewable energy for federal energy purchase requirements. For example, if a federal agency has access to thermal energy from groundwater to heat or cool its facilities. Under the inhoff carper Amendment, that thermal energy would be considered renewable energy produced just as if the buildings had solar or wind power to produce electricity. And I hope that colleagues in this kind of spirit will bring us these kinds of suggestions and ideas. Senator Inhofe has brought this to us you know, early uh, on, and I know that we're going to have some more discussion because of its connection to other kinds of matters, but I hope that we will get a vote on this. It is common sense. It is practical. I intend to support it, and I just wanted the record to reflect that, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President. Uh, Senator from Ohio. Mr. President, as author uh, uh, with Senator Sheen of the underlying bill, I just want to say I've got a list here of, of a dozen uh, or so bipartisan amendments that um, I'd love to see us have a debate on, including the Inhofe Amendment, which I think the Inhofe Carper Amendment is, is a great example, as the Chairman just said, of one that actually improves the bill. As I said earlier, there will be some amendments that we may not find bipartisan consensus on, but this is certainly one, and I think it's common sense, and I appreciate him working with the committee and working with us. And I just wish we could get it up for a vote uh, and get it filed today. Uh, and I do hope that we can work out our differences on uh, other amendments so that, uh, that are not relevant to the legislation so that we can move ahead with some of this good debate. And my sense is we, we have a good chance of doing that. So I would urge both sides of the aisle, let's figure out how to come together with, some, with a practical solution here to be able to provide a vote but to also allow us to proceed with, with this debate. Senator Inhofe came over here to offer his amendment. He wasn't able to, and uh, I hope we can, for the next uh, good bipartisan amendment, have that opportunity. Uh, with that, I, I, I yield. The Senator from Louisiana. Mr. President, let me offer this truly friendly suggestion. I think we can proceed with this debate. Senator Portman said proceed with the debate. We can proceed with this debate right now. We can bring amendments to the floor. We can talk about them. We can have a full debate on any amendment folks want to bring to the floor. I would encourage that, and I think that will move the process along because we can basically do all of the substantive debate uh, on these amendments. The only thing I'm talking about is a technicality, which is making the amendment pending. That's a technicality that doesn't have to stop or delay or prohibit any debate. So my suggestion is to move full forward with that debate as we work out this agreement, and I'm fully prepared in the same way to discuss and debate my amendment, and I'm, I'm ready to do that uh, whenever it's appropriate. The senator from Oklahoma. Yeah, I don't recall this ever happening before. The, the very uh, amendment that is keeping the obstacle for me is one that I would ask unanimous consent right now to become a co-sponsor of that amendment, the bitter amendment I'm talking about. And I, I know what he's trying to do, and I know that he's going to make an effort to get this done in other, uh, maybe other legislation if it doesn't happen here. So uh, I will be joining him in his cause, and I see this as a separate thing here because, uh, as I say, we want to move this along. I do have an amendment that uh, everyone agrees to, and I, so I'll stand by and see if anyone changes their mind. And thank you, I, I say to the, um, to the chairman and the ranking member, thank you for your comments, your very kind comments uh, about my amendment. I, I would note the absence of a quorum, Mr. President. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
senator from Colorado. Mr. President, uh, are we in a quorum call? We are. Uh, I'd ask unanimous consent the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me, let me start by uh, asking uh, for simple unanimous consent uh, approval. I want to uh, ask that uh, Kevin Reed, who's a legislative fellow in my office, uh, be granted four uh, floor privileges for the uh, remainder of consideration of uh, Senate Bill 1392. Is there objection? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I was uh, next going to ask unanimous consent to set aside the pending amendment and call up uh, my amendment to number uh, 1845. I understand that uh, uh, the Senate's at a bit of an impasse, but if I might, I'd like to talk about my amendment uh, without calling it up with uh, hope that later uh, my friend and colleague, Senator Wyden, would be able to call up my amendment and put it on the list of pending amendments. The uh, senator may proceed. So uh, uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, this important effort, which uh, has been authored in partnership with my, my good friend from the uh, wonderful state of Maine, uh, Senator Collins. I want to take a minute before I do that and say how important it is that we're finally debating uh, for the first time in years an energy bill in the Senate. And I think the fact that we're here today is a huge testament to my colleague from the great state of New Hampshire, Senator Shaheen, and uh, my good friend uh, from the days I served in the House and now a fellow senator from the great state of Ohio, Senator Portman, uh, and the leadership uh, of uh, Chairman Wyden and Ranking Member Murkowski that we're here today uh, beginning this important debate. Um, and for, I think, Senator Portman and Senator Shaheen are saying this in, in every way possible, for our country to truly uh, realize energy independence and energy security, we need to efficiently use the energy that we already have. And that's exactly what Senator Shaheen and Senator Portman envision with their legislation. We, we promote energy security and we save Americans uh, money. Uh, so uh, with that backdrop, Mr. President, let me turn to uh, our amendment. Uh, improving the energy efficiency of our schools is a, is a no-brainer. And that's why I'm proud to partner with Senator Collins to make sure our efforts have the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, this is a bipartisan amendment. It will help streamline efforts to improve the energy efficiency of our nation's schools, while most importantly, strengthening our children's education. Uh, our schools are often confused by where to go and who to work with to pursue energy efficiency efforts in education. And, and this is in part because how, of how many agencies and uh, departments, state governments and the like are involved. So by providing a coordinating structure for schools to better navigate existing federal programs and the financing options available to them, we're going to pare back uh, duplicative efforts and uh, make it easier for schools across my state of, of Colorado and across the uh, United States to save thousands of taxpayer dollars each year that then can be reinvested in strengthening our education system. Uh, the amendment also has the dual benefit of making federal programs work better uh, for our schools while still leaving decisions to the states, school boards, and local officials to determine what is best uh, for their schools. Uh, this is a common sense amendment, uh, and I truly hope we get a chance to debate it, to have an up or down uh, uh, vote on it. And before I yield the floor, uh, Mr. President, I'd also like to point out, and I know my colleague, Senator Wyden is well aware of this, and Senator Shaheen, Senator Portman, Senator Murkowski, that when we have schools that operate on an energy efficient basis, studies show that our, our uh, young people, our children, learn more effectively. Because if you're in an environment that's comfortable, where the light is appropriate, uh, where you can see, uh, where you can take in what's being taught, you're, of course, going to have a better educational experience. And a better educated America means a stronger America, means a more productive America, a more competitive America. So this has benefits across the board in every way imaginable. The broader effort uh, that Senator Shaheen and Portman have brought forward, but also that uh, Senator Wyden uh, and uh, Murkowski uh, are, are helming here on the floor of the Senate. So again, I just want to uh, draw attention to this important amendment. I want to thank my colleague, Senator Collins. I know she will be here later to talk about uh, her perspectives. Uh, and the other good work that she's going to do when it comes to this important piece of legislation. So with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor and again thank my colleagues. Mr. President. The Senator from Oregon. Mr. President, I just want to, before he leaves the, uh, the floor of the Senate, just commend uh, my colleague from Colorado, uh, Senator Udall. This is a practical, 
common sense amendment. There is no new expenditure of federal funds. I'm very pleased that my colleague brought it to the floor. It's reflective of the approach we see in the Energy Committee and a host of areas where the Senator from Colorado consistently tries to fight com common ground and to act in a bipartisan way. And one of the reasons I wanted to speak for just a minute is now we're starting to see, Mr. President and colleagues, these bipartisan amendments are starting to sort of pile up. And that's because colleagues are listening to what folks at home are saying. They're saying to Senator Udall and Senator Shaheen and Senator Portman and myself and Senator Murkowski, they're saying when y'all are back there in the fall, try to find some ways to get things done, to get people to work together. I think we all understand how important energy is and energy security. It's about jobs. It's about a cleaner environment. It's about productivity. And when you look at the specifics of this amendment that Senator Udall and Senator Collins are, are pursuing, sometimes you think it's maybe too logical for the beltway because people say it just makes too much sense. When schools do retrofits under the uh, Collins Udall amendment to become more energy efficient and use cleaner power, the kids come out winners, the environment comes out a winner, and the taxpayers come out, you know, winners. That's the whole reason, Mr. President, the federal government provides assistance to schools for these types of projects in the first place. It's an opportunity for the federal government to save money and ensure that we maximize educational opportunities for the kids. But the reality is federal school efficiency programs are now strewn really all over the federal government. They're scattered among more than six different agencies. The states have all these different programs and incentives. And so what Senator Collins and Senator Udall seek to do is to have a straightforward mechanism for improved federal coordination. In the real world, that means we're going to have more energy projects built. It means more schools are going to save energy and money. And I'll also note, because my friend Senator Murkowski is here, that uh, the Udall Collins Amendment pretty much tracks something that we've been interested in, that the committee's uh, been uh, looking at, uh, S-1048, uh, which was heard by the Energy Subcommittee on, on June 25th. So again, no authorization. The minimal costs are covered by existing DOE funds. I want to commend uh, the senator from Colorado for his good work, particularly the bipartisan focus he's put on this and everything else about his uh, Senate business. I hope we'll be able to vote on it. And I wanted colleagues, as this debate uh, starts, to see that we're going to start stacking up these good, common sense, bipartisan amendments. And that's why there is so much value in, in energy efficiency. So, you know, before you came, I said we all get worked up around here saying that we're for all of the above, you know, energy policy. It's almost obligatory to say you're for all of the above three times every kind of 10, 15 minutes. You can't be for an all of the above energy policy unless you're for energy efficiency. And you're bringing some of that sensible thinking to the schools. So I'm looking forward to getting your amendment up and voting on it and commend you for your good, your good work. And uh, I would just yield back, uh, Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, I too want to thank the Senator from Colorado and the Senator from Maine for, for their leadership uh, in this area. When you think about being efficient, okay, let's coordinate, let's collaborate, let's, let's really uh, cooperate here so that we do better with what it is that we're utilizing. Um, I'm going to give an example of, of how something like this can make a difference in, in my state. I've, I've noted before that our energy costs in Alaska are some of the highest in the nation. Um, far too often our, our schools are in remote areas where basically they, they're not part of anybody's grid. They are, they're in communities that are diesel powered. It's, it is a tough way to, to heat a community. But think about how expensive it then becomes for your school. Your school has to absorb these energy costs. Where do these dollars come from? They come 
effectively out of your education budget. And the state does step in. The state provides um, substantial assistance. But anywhere, anytime, any place that we can be working together to, to again, uh, be more collaborative in our approaches as, as to how we deal with, uh, with our efficiency opportunities. These are going to help our schools. This is going to help the schools, whether they are in Maine or whether they are in Alaska or Colorado. Why are all these places colder? I'm not sure, but uh, maybe it forces us to be a little more efficient. Maybe it forces us to, to figure out ways that we can be working together better. I want to make sure that we're able to get the education dollars into the classroom and not basically fueling the boilers to keep the kids warm. So I applaud my, my colleagues in, in this effort. The goal to increase coordination and cooperation of federal, state, and local agencies to be operating more efficiently, <laughs> utilizing existing relationships, I think is, is a positive here. So again, I commend my colleagues uh, for their efforts in, in bringing us forward uh, on this particular aspect of, of energy efficiency. And I too look forward to the opportunity where we'll be able to show a good bipartisan uh, vote on this amendment and on others. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Maine. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I want to congratulate the bill's sponsors, Senator Shaheen and Portman, for crafting the underlying bipartisan common sense energy efficiency bill. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of their legislation and I'm pleased to see that the bill is being considered and look forward to the debate on energy efficiency. I would hope that as we consider amendments to this bill, that we could consider amendments that relate to the issue of energy so that we can make real progress and that we don't end up, uh, as happened before the recess, of when I was managing a bill on the transportation and housing appropriations uh, for the minority side, that we became distracted on two issues that had nothing to do with the underlying bill, important though it was. So I'm very pleased to join my colleague, the distinguished senator from Colorado, Mr. Udall, in sponsoring an amendment to help streamline the available federal energy efficiency programs and financing to help improve the health and lower energy costs for our nation's schools. Now, Mr. President, there are a number of federal initiatives already available to schools to help them become more efficient. However, in many cases, schools are not taking full advantage of these programs, and I think this is particularly a problem in rural states like Alaska or like Maine where the schools don't have the luxury of having grant writers who can spend all day searching for federal funding that might allow them uh, to upgrade the energy efficiency or reduce emissions from their energy systems. Perhaps large urban schools may have the ability to hire those full-time grant writers. But I know in my state of Maine uh, that it's very difficult for schools to even become aware of these programs. And one of the purposes of the, the amendment that Senator Udall and I are offering is to help schools, regardless of their size, take advantage of existing programs. And I want to stress that we're not creating a whole lot of new programs here. All we're doing is providing a streamlined coordinating structures for schools to help them better navigate available federal programs and financing options. 
I also want to emphasize, uh, particularly to my Republican colleagues, that our amendment still leaves all the decisions to the states, to local school boards, to local officials, about how best to meet the energy needs of their schools. So what does our amendment do? Specifically, the amendment would establish the Department of Energy as the lead agency in coordinating a cross-developmental effort to help initiate, develop, and finance energy efficiency, renewable energy, and retrofitting projects for our schools. It would also require a review of existing federal programs and financing mechanisms the formation of a streamlined process of communication and outreach to the states, local education agencies, and schools of these existing programs to make them more aware of their existence, and the development of a mechanism for governors, state energy programs, and local educational and energy officials to form a peer-to-peer -peer network to support the initiation of these projects. Finally, the amendment would require the Department of Energy to provide technical assistance to help schools navigate the financing and development of these projects. Mr. President, assisting our nation's schools in navigating and tapping into existing federal programs that will help them lower their energy usage and save taxpayer dollars, save money at a time of very tight, constrained educational budgets, simply makes good common sense. So I would urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support the Udall Collins Amendment number 1845 I want to thank not only the sponsors of the bill, uh, but the leaders of the Energy Committee, Senator Wyden and Senator Murkowski, uh, for their help and assistance to us. And I hope that we can start the debate on this bill up on a positive note by adopting a bipartisan amendment that's going to help our schools save money, reduce energy costs, and, and also lower emissions. That's the way to start the debate on this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I want to thank Senators Collins and Udall for coming to the floor with their positive amendment, laying it out and debating it. And I would encourage everyone with an interest in this bill, uh, Democrats and Republicans, to do the same, come to the floor, lay out amendments, have that debate so we can move forward in a productive way as the first vote agreement is being worked on and finalized. And that's what I'm going to do, proceed to do with regard to my amendment. So let me do that now. Uh, now, Mr. President, my amendment is not related to this bill. Uh, but I have to bring it up now because it's very time sensitive. It's about something that is very wrong, in my opinion, that's happening October 1st. Now, Mr. President, many of us in this chamber, certainly myself, regularly talk against the exemptions under Obamacare that are created for the rich and powerful and politically connected. Many in this body, including myself, regularly talk about the abuses of this administration going beyond their legitimate authority, going beyond what's in the law, making up stuff through executive orders, through rulemaking, through executive fiat. And as I said, certainly I'm in that group. I believe an action was taken recently that is a horrible dangerous and offensive example of both of those things. And my amendment would correct that situation. So let me back up and explain just what I'm talking about. Right after all of Congress left for the August recess, a little over a month ago, uh, the Office of Personnel Management, part of the Obama administration, issued a draft rule. 
And this draft rule was basically designed to take any of the sting of Obamacare away for Washington insiders, specifically members of Congress and congressional staff. You see, during the Obamacare debate, we debated an amendment on the Senate floor, and it, to my pleasant surprise, was actually adopted. And the amendment said every member of Congress, all the congressional staff, have to go to the exchange, have to leave their very generous federal employee health benefit plan coverage and go to the exchange, have to go to the fallback position in terms of health care coverage that millions of Americans are dealing with and have to go to right now and over the next several months. And they have to live under those same rules and under those same circumstances as those tens of millions of Americans. I supported that. I think it's important that the ruling elite, if you will, need to live under the same laws they create across the board. And specifically under Obamacare, I think it's very, very important that uh, everybody in Congress and in Washington, and I think this should be expanded to the administration, live under the same system in terms of the exchange that many of those folks created. Now, that was the statute. That's supposed to govern. Uh, after Obamacare passed, to quote Nancy Pelosi, folks started looking and reading the bill to figure out what was in it. And uh, lots of folks around here in Washington got very concerned once they read that provision to figure out what was in it. And they understood that that would create real dislocation and sting not for America, it does that, but they weren't concerned enough about that, but for Washington. And so many people for months lobbied the administration to try to get around this, to make up some reg that would take the sting out of that provision. And sure enough, after intense lobbying, sure enough, the Obama administration issued this rule, again, as I mentioned a minute ago, it was right after we left town and were safely away, right at the start of the August recess. Now, the rule did a few things, uh, all of which I think are beyond the law, contrary to law, and really outrageous. First of all, it said uh, that the statute, which says that all official staff of members of Congress need to go to the exchanges, first thing the rule says is we, we don't know what official staff means. So we're going to leave it up to each individual member of Congress to decide if any member of their staff is official staff. So each member of Congress can decide whether anybody on their staff has to go to the exchange at all. Now, I think that's ludicrous on its face and completely contrary to the statute. But then the second big thing the rule did is uh, made out of thin air the rule that the present subsidy we get from the taxpayer for our present health care coverage is going to somehow miraculously turn into a subsidy on the exchange, which doesn't exist, doesn't exist for us under the law, doesn't exist for any American. And so they just made up out of thin air this rule that that taxpayer-funded subsidy would follow all of these folks, members of Congress and the staff who are required to go there to the exchange. Again, that is not in the law. That is contrary to the letter and spirit of this provision. And there is a separate provision of Obamacare that specifically says with regard to all individuals going to the exchange that when they do this, when they go to a plan on the exchange, they lose their employer-provided subsidy. So that is specific about the situation of folks going to the exchange and directly contrary to this law. Well, Mr. President, as I suggested at the beginning, I think this is a special exemption for Washington, a special bailout for Washington to ensure that Washington doesn't have to live by the same rules, in this case with regard to Obamacare and the exchanges, that all of America does. And it's beyond the statute and it's beyond the president's constitutional authority. He can't just make things up out of thin air. 
For that reason, I've joined with many colleagues to draft a bill which we've made an amendment to this bill to propose that would fix that. And it is no Washington exemption from Obamacare. Specifically, the bill would do three things. First of all, uh, it does away with this OPM rule and it clarifies that members don't get to pick and choose who is official staff. Congressional staff is congressional staff. Then it says all members of Congress, all congressional staff, and we expand it to the president and vice president and all political appointees of the Obama administration, all of those folks have to go to the exchanges. The clear language of present law with regard to members of Congress and their staff. And finally, we fix the other part of this illegal rule. We say that this subsidy that members of Congress and staff currently enjoy under uh, their present health care coverage can't follow you to the exchange. That's not the case for any other American. That's not in the law. In fact, in Obamacare, there's a broader provision completely contrary to that. So we say that cannot happen. And that's what our bill and our amendment is. I think it is a fundamental, a threshold, and a very important rule of democracy that the governors have to live by the same laws that they pass and impose on the governed. I think that should be the case across the board, and certainly that should be the case under Obamacare. Tens of millions of Americans are experiencing having to go to the exchanges. Many of them didn't want to go there. Many of them had good coverage with their employer that they're losing because of the economics of this new situation and they're being forced to the exchange. The clear language and intent of that provision in Obamacare was for members of Congress and staff to have to experience the same thing. And that, was, that is the clear language and that is the clear intent. So we should live by that, not get around that. And in my opinion, we should expand that to the president who has volunteered to go to the exchange, to the vice president, to all of their political appointees. And so that's what our amendment does. That's what our bill does. I want to thank all of the members, Senate and House, who are working hard on this proposal, Senators Enzi and Heller, uh, Johnson, um, uh, many others. I know I'm missing several. There's several House members led by Congressman Ron DeSantis of Florida who are working on identical House language. They're hard at work particularly in the context of the CR. The bottom line is this. There should be no special Washington exemption from Obamacare. All laws that we pass should apply to us every bit as much as other Americans. And certainly we, as is the clear language and is the clear intent, should live under that fallback plan of the exchanges just like every other American does. And no other American gets this special subsidy that the OPM rule gives to us. Now, folks in this class under my amendment and bill would be able to qualify for a subsidy if it's the same subsidy that's available to other Americans according to income category. So if you qualify by income, fine. But this is way beyond that. This is a special deal, a special exemption for Congress. And we need to say there should be no Washington exemption. This bill, this amendment does that clearly and categorically. And I urge my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, to support this. Now, Mr. President, let me end by just talking about a vote. I'm uh, bringing up this amendment on this bill. The reason is this issue is very time sensitive. This rule, which was made up out of thin air, in my opinion, goes into effect and all of this is set to happen October 1st. And so this debate has to happen. A change to this has to happen before October 1st. 
and that's why I'm bringing it up now and demanding a vote. Uh, but actually, that vote doesn't have to be on this bill. I will accept any fair, reasonable, substantive vote before October 1st, but we need to lock that down. Uh, I think we're well on our way to locking that down, and I look forward to that. In the meantime, Mr. President, let me just again urge my colleagues who have amendments to this bill on the subject of energy, on any other subject, come on down, present those, talk about those, debate those, as I have, as Senators Udall and Collins have. Let's move forward with the process as we nail down this first vote agreement. And as we get to that vote on this amendment, I urge my colleagues to follow the first, in many ways, most basic rule of democracy, that the same rules we impose on the governed, we should live by. That is absolutely essential. Should be that case across the board, certainly including Obamacare. And in the case of Obamacare, there's specific language that says that. That's what it says. That's what it's supposed to be about. And this illegal OPM rule completely invalidates and gets around that. And so we need to act and fix that now, well before October 1st. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President.